evening. So we're in Psalm 9, and we read here, Prayer and thanksgiving for the Lord's righteous judgments to the chief musician to the tune of Death of the Son, a Psalm of David. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence, for you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. O oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory is perished, but the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praise. In the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made, in the net which they hid, their own food is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Meditation. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. All right, now I have to tell you a little bit about this. First of all, that Psalms 9 and 10 were originally part of, they were together. They were 9 and 10, all one Psalm, as it is in the Hebrew Bible. And also it forms an acrostic, which means that it starts with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet working their way through it in Psalms 9 and 10. So if you split them in half, you can't really see that. But real, basically they're the same um, in the Hebrew. And then it just tells you that, that the Psalm 10 does not have a superscript or a title telling you much more about it other than it says in our Bibles there, a song of confidence in God's triumph over evil, but it doesn't tell you about it's to the chief musician, to the tune of Death and Son. When I read to the tune of Death and Son, how many know that tune? Does anyone know the tune Death of the Son? I didn't think so. And I, as soon as I thought about it, I, could, I can only think of like, it would, today it would be like, if you said it's to the tune of Death and the Son, people would be thinking, is that a heavy metal song? It sounds like something really heavy, you know, like it's death metal or something like that, right? What is this death of the sun? I don't know who the sun is referring to, but in our Bibles, it might be in a couple S to simply say it could be referring to the son of God. Okay, but anyway, the point is that he's a certain tune that is on his mind, and he says, I know you all know the tune. So here's the way this is supposed to be sung, or this to be prayed, this particular psalm. And so do you notice that in verse one, he says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. And I wonder uh, when we're praising God, do we give in everything we've got. Do we really? How many can say, yes, there's been times when I've been a bit half-hearted, you know, don't really do much when it comes to uh, worshiping God. There are people in churches, have you ever seen them going a bit wild? I, like at a football match, ever seen them? They're really giving in everything they've got. And then there's other people that be standing there with their hands in their pockets and saying, I wonder why I'm here even. Because there's a difference in your attitude when it comes to worship. I've, I've said this before. I've seen people go wild over the football matches and scoring goals. They get absolutely excited. I've seen a guy crawling on his knees across the floor. I've seen a German, when we were watching that in 1996, I don't know if he's ever watching this, but him and his wife watched the Euros, England versus Germany in our house. And these, these very conservative German people in church, you know, but when they, Germany scored a goal, she was literally jumping up and down on our couch. And I said, oh yeah, 
oh yeah, it doesn't happen in church, but it does happen when it comes to things like that. We should be excited about the things of God and giving it all our worship and praise. As he says here, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wondrous or your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And just think about it. There are people who are absolutely, if you talk about a worship service, they'd be saying, I want to be at the worship service. They'd have a worship of thorns or praise of thorns. They love to worship and praise God. And that's as far as it goes. We are to be worshipers, true, but not just be worshipers. He says here, I will praise you, Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. We got to be not just praisers, but tellers. Isn't that right? We got to tell the world, what are you praising God for? What are you so excited about? Tell of the things that God is doing in your life or to tell the gospel, share with people the great news of why we worship and praise God. Amen. Now, he gives the reason why he's praising God in the next few verses. Verses 3 to, to 5, he says, When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on your, on the throne, judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. And uh, if you think back to what David was talking about, he's talking about the times he's gone into battle, he's been fighting with enemies, other nations, other, other than Israel, of course, the nations outside of Israel. He's fighting with them. Have you ever heard of the Philistines before? The Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. There are lots of different nations out there. And, you know, David was talking about how God had given him the victory over his enemies. And, you know, in a generation before that, the people of Israel used to go into battle with the Ark of the Covenant. You know what that is? The Ark of the Covenant? The piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle, which had the cherubim on top and had the Ten Commandments inside it. And it was the, uh, a symbol of God's presence. And they went into battle with that. And when they went into, into battle with the presence of God, uh, it would just obliterate the enemy. They would just be on the run all the time. So whether we have the ark of God's presence or just the fact of God's presence with us, that should give us the victory. Amen? And how many of you know that God is with you and will give you the victory also? Amen? Because David is talking about it was, it was because of God with us. That's the only reason we were able to have the victory. I was just thinking about how David was saying, it's only it's not because I'm any better than anybody else, but God is maintaining my right and my cause, what I'm for, what I'm all about what my purposes are and my plans are. And uh, because God will judge the nations in perfect justice. Have you ever thought about God judging all the nations of the world? We were talking about this just on uh, Tuesday night about how God judges all the peoples of the world. And I was thinking back to some of these people. Let's just have a look over to Genesis chapter 18 because he mentions some of the people and you may wonder where are these people today? Genesis chapter 15 and um, this is God speaking to Abraham and saying, to your descendants, this is verse uh, Genesis 15, 18 to 21, to your descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now listen to this, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Kenites, the Gershites, and the Jebusites. Got to be careful how you say some of these names. Um, but that's just amazing that all these people, you've heard them and you go, where are they today? Where have they gone? God has judged them and sometimes they're just completely forgotten people. And also over in Exodus chapter 33, have a look there, verse 2, it says, um, and I will send my angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So, that is what was happening in some of these battles and these wars that David was having. He was just seeing God going with them into battle and destroying their enemies. Amen. And their name, look what it says there in verse 5. You've rebuked the nations. You've destroyed the wicked. You've blotted out their name forever and ever. The reason why I read some of those um, names there is because you probably never even heard of them today. You may have heard of the, there's Egypt and there's people in Iran and there's people in Persia. But some of these um, people groups are completely forgotten and all you'll find maybe is a few archaeological sites you know, what's left of these people oh, well there's a broken bit of pottery here and there that type, type of thing you think where are all these people gone they were so great at one time but God has judged them and they're gone forever and ever 
Um, verse 6. O enemy, destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. Basically the same type of thing, I would think. Even their memory has perished, but the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples. And uh, if you think about that, I couldn't help. When I saw the, the fact that I've talked about God's judgment and his throne, how does God judge the nations? I mean, is there going to be a time in which God will gather all the peoples of the world and gather them together and bring forth judgment? Well, I couldn't help but think about a verse. Uh, you might want to turn over to Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 20, I believe it is. Yes, and verse 11 onwards. Now listen to this. Now this is a frightening scene. I thought, you know, before I was a Christian, or maybe just as a new Christian, thinking about the fact of the judgments of God and how would that work out? Now we were talking about this on Tuesday night. Like there must be millions and or maybe billions and billions of people. I don't know how many people there will be, but it does say this in Revelation chapter eleven, um, chapter twenty, verse eleven. Then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What a horrible scene, or a dreadful scene. Depends how you look at it, but you see, this is God bringing absolute judgment in. And he's not a cruel judge, is he? Is he a bad judge? Is he a good judge of character? Do you think God is a good judge? The perfect judge who knows every detail of everything that was ever done in anyone's life. And it's not just the nations of the world. Um, there, there's a TV program I used to watch a lot, I must admit, called A Thousand Ways to Die. Has anyone ever seen that before? There are many different ways you can die. And yet there are really only two ways. And so it doesn't really matter how or when or why, but the state in which you are when you die, and that's the most important because there really are only two states. That is number one, to be in Christ, in faith. That's one. And the other one is to be without Christ and without faith. And we have to ask ourselves, okay, which one am I? Am I a person who is gonna die ready knowing exactly where I'm going, because all these nations and all these people are going to have to answer this one thing. And where are you at with God? That's a very a powerful question to ask people. Just You don't have to be super evangelistic to be able to ask a person, how are things between you and God? What's the state of your life? You know, should I, do you mind if I ask you that? You know, where do you stand with God? And if a person says, well, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm religious. I'm a good person. I'm a godly person. I know that's fine, but are, where do you stand with God? Are you standing in faith? Are you believing in Christ? And have you trusted in him for your salvation? Or are you not? You're either in one state or the other. And so it's it, regardless of how you die or when you die or why, all those things are irrelevant to the point. To, the most important point is the state in which you die. And that is the big question you've got to ask today. Okay, those people... God is going to judge them, and we are going to have to stand there. Uh, if we're not believers, we're going to stand before that judgment. Okay, let's read on from Psalm 9. Uh, verse 9 says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And so it's probably not talking about every form of oppression that, you know, there's people who say, I'm feeling oppressed. I felt 
down, I felt depressed, or even demonic depression, although it could include that. That seems to be more to do with nations and peoples who oppress other people groups. And God, in that whole thing, is judging the nations and said, I'm going to sort that out, but I'm also going to, I'm going to remind you this, I don't forget the oppressed. I don't forget what you're going through or the things that you've faced in your life. God is going to make sure that you get what is coming to you and justice is coming for you. Amen? How many have ever felt like, God, when are you going to answer me? When are you going to help me? When are you going to lift me out of the problems that I'm facing right now? Maybe you need God's hand upon your life, but you've got to do something. What does it say here? It says, uh, for, and those who know your name, God, know who you're talking to, know your name and put your trust in him. And also, and for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You've got to seek God. You're not going to just apparently get answers to prayer without seeking God. You've got to ask God, God, I need you. I'm seeking you. I'm looking for you to come into my life and help me. And if you're not doing that, you may not, you may not see or experience any help at all coming from the Lord. So going back to what he says here, this is with David's attitude to it all. In verse 11, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. And some translations will say they're the afflicted. Again, the whole idea being that I'm going to sing praises. Why? Because I'm already expecting an answer. You know what David's praising God for? That God, you've heard me. You're just like he said in the, the first verse, first couple of verses, I'm going to sing praise and give thanks to the Lord because he remembers me. He remembers the poor, the afflicted. He remembers those who have, have been murdered. Even verse 12, he avenges blood. He remembers them and does not forget the cry of those who are humble or who have been afflicted. And you know what? He talks about Zion simply because he knows that it's because God's presence is with us in Zion. Does anyone know where Zion is? Anyone? It's referring to Jerusalem and the tabernacle or the temple there where God's presence was. And they always look to that and say, God, you dwell amongst us in Israel. Praise God for his presence with us. So again, he's back to praising God. And then verse 13, have mercy on me, O Lord. You know, we got to cry out for mercy at times and just say, God, it's not about just needing mercy for forgiveness, but mercies, the tender mercies of God, which are new for us every morning. How many of, our, of us are walking in the mercies of God on a daily basis? Goodness and mercy are following you all the days of your life. And that's why David can say, have mercy on me, O Lord. I'm not better than anybody else, but I totally need your mercy. Consider my trouble from those, who is it? Those who hate me and who lift me up, you who lift me up from the gates of death. We saw in, a, in the previous psalm, um, that was Psalm 7, verses 14, uh, I believe it was. Psalm 7, where it talks about, I was at the gates of death. Was it Psalm 5, perhaps? I don't know which one it was. It was where he was saying, I'm at the point of death and I need someone to lift me up. And here again, he's talking about how I'm right there. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. And so David has got people who are not only hating him, but are people who want to destroy him and trouble him on all sides and bring him to death. That's why he says, you who lift me up from the gates of death. David has been at the point where he's nearly dying. And do you believe that God can snatch a person from the gates of death? Do you believe that? that no matter how bad things are, are and no matter how rough things are no matter even if you're dying and even if you had a terrible sickness he said i'm dying this is killing me i've been wounded or mortally wounded it's, i'm in a bad state do you believe that god could even then still reach a person and say i'm gonna lift you up and snatch you from the very gates of death itself that's what he's doing and i want to be singing praises in the temple of god i want to be in zion that's what he says here that i may tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughter of zion i will rejoice in your salvation Amen. Now listen to this. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made, in the net which they hid, their own uh, food is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Meditation. So he's again talking about the nations. And sometimes there's been plots against God's people. There have been all kinds of um, in, throughout the Bible, you see examples of where the enemy has tried to plot something and to destroy God's people. I was thinking back, for example, of the story of Esther. How many are familiar with the story of Esther and how Haman, wicked Haman, tried to a plot to kill all the Jews? And what happened? Does anyone know what happened? 
Esther chapter 7, it was Haman himself was hung for his crimes, uh, trying to destroy God's people. And there are many examples of that where the enemy has tried to plot something, maybe he's plotted against you in your life, and something has totally backfired. The enemy's plans can often backfire on himself. Just a few examples of that. Um, we can read uh, over in Proverbs chapter 1. Just a reference there to these things. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 16, it says, actually I should read from, yeah, verse 16. For their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk, lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. And sometimes it's not just waiting for God's judgments to come. That, it, oh, we're going to wait until judgment day and this will all be sorted out. Sometimes God has stepped in in history, hasn't he? And just caused a thing to just totally backfire and fall apart, a plan and a plot to, to destroy somebody. And uh, yeah, God is doing that. We may not recognize it happening. Sometimes we just see strange things going on and we wonder why did that particular thing happen? Why did that whole thing fall apart or that plan backfire? Maybe it was because God was dealing with those people in their lives. Okay, uh, David spoke about this also in, in the previous psalm. He says that they have tried to do this and plot against me, made it all backfire on them as well. And that's in Psalm 7, 14 to 16. Okay, just a few more parts here. Um, verses 17 to 18. That this is the part which people are not really, really, really uh, keen on these words. Uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. You know, there are churches that I've actually been in churches where they refuse to use the word hell. They refuse to use the word judgment. They barely use the word sin. And they barely use the word repent because, you know, they're not really that popular. If we talk, start talking about hell and that kind of stuff, it's going to just scare people off. How many have ever been scared about hell? Ever, ever, ever been scared about the thought of hell itself? I know a guy who told me recently, he says, the reason I became a Christian because I was scared of going to hell. Well, here's the thing. Hell may be scary, but it shouldn't be the biggest thing you should be scared of. The biggest thing we should have a fear of is the fear of the Lord. Amen? It's, uh, just turn over with me to um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Here we read, I might as well read from verse 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. So we got to speak it out there, right? And verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that is simply, I mean, we, we can argue whether it's talking about hell or the grave, but, you know, it's it's really the place of the wicked. They're going to be destroyed in a place called hell forever. That is clearly what we saw in the book of Revelation a moment ago. But you know what? It shouldn't be a fear of hell itself. That we, we should be saying it is the God who has the power to do that. Amen. Who has the power to take our life and say, you're, you're finished, you're doomed, you're condemned under the wrath of God. And we should be cast into hell because of our sinfulness. But it's also the God, the same God who does that is the God who rescues us. Amen. How many of you can say, I have been rescued, not only from the gates of death, but also from hell itself. God has rescued me. I'm not headed in that direction because God has done that. But the, as for the wicked, they shall be turned into hell. They will be cast into hell. That's for sure. But what does the next line say? And the nations that forget God. Is it such a bad thing to forget God? Well, let's have a look um, over in Romans. Just a few verses here. You know, Paul spoke to the, the believers in Rome. And he was saying this. And one of the verses just stands out is Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And this is about uh, the condemnation of not just the Roman people, but also the all the nations of the world. If we we can be one of those people, it could be speaking to us because it says there, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind 
to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent pride, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So what did these people decide to do? Let's just not even think about God. Don't even bring him into my thoughts. And that's the way a lot of people are. I do some evangelism and I talk to people and they just try to suppress the truth. They don't want to know. Don't talk about it. Uh, you don't if you talk to me about God, I'm not going to listen. I just I'm going to walk out and give you start talking about God. Why is that? Because they don't want you to bring up that thing which will stir their conscience because they know God, even though they say, I do not know if there's a God, as we see, and also in Romans chapter one, in uh, a little bit earlier on, it says, um, let me see, from verse 20, Romans 1 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse although they knew god now it doesn't say they didn't know god and they don't know if there's a god that exists it says they knew god they did not glorify him as god nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to the un to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So because they didn't want to acknowledge God, they opened themselves up to all kinds of idolatry and deception because they don't want God in my life. I don't want to hear about him. And so what happens? They end up going in that way that like David spoke again in Psalm 9. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God or acknowledge, don't want to acknowledge God, ignore him altogether. But as for God, he doesn't forget a single thing. Not only does he not forget, but he says, the needy shall not always be forgotten and the, the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Though God, though people may forget, God will never forget. And he always has his eye on the, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the people who are poor and needy, and he thinks about them and concerns that he's concerned for them. And maybe you're that, that person today said, I need God. Yes, God is judging the nations. God's doing all this stuff. But I hope he hasn't forgotten me and the things that uh, I'm facing in my life at this time. Okay, and lastly, last couple of verses. He says, arise, O Lord. Do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. So what's he's trying to say there? Well, uh, David had said in the previous psalm, in Psalm, I think it's just a few ago that we looked at, where he told God, arise, O Lord, arise up, rise up and come to my help. And because he sees God as a great warrior who comes to the help of him. And you know, this psalm, and that part of Psalm 9, um, where he says, arise, Oh Lord, it's known as a pre-battle hymn or a pre-battle song. Do you know when you psych yourself up and you're about to go into battle, you sing a chant in a song. Maybe they do it in football and other games as well. But they said, let's go out. We're going to face the enemy. Well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to go out, but we need God to arise and go with us. So he prays like this. It says, arise, oh Lord, let, do not let man prevail. We don't want to see men uh, in victorious we want to let them know that they're simply men at the end of the day and you know what he says let the nations be judged in your sight of course they're going to be judged but i was reminded when i read that of what we read one of the opening psalms that we saw was psalm 2 and how we you can just turn over there real quick psalm 2 it's he asked the question at the very beginning i think it's a marvelous thing that he asked he says in verse 1 why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. You know, there's a rebelliousness in mankind. It's not just in one person. It's in a whole nation of people. It's all the nations that are, where, I mean, think about it. They are arrayed against God. They want to fight. They rebellion. They're in revolt. They're in rebellion. And they are, they hate God. And they, they might, you might meet people and, and if you told them, you know what your problem is? You have a hatred toward God. You are in rebellion against God. You don't want to bow down to his ways. They'll say, I don't hate God. I'm a nice person. I'm a good person. I'm a religious person. But in our heart, you know what it is? I will not bow my knees to Jesus Christ. I will not bow my name and uh, bow, bow down to him and call him Lord. And that is the biggest problem. Our, our problem is rebellion in the heart. And we need to get to the place where we say, Jesus is Lord, and I bow my knee. Amen. So here is the situation in Psalm 2. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but when God sees the feeble attempts of mankind to rise up against him, he sits in heaven and he laughs. That's what it says there. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in derision because his will will be done. And so there we see in Psalm 9 verse 19 arise O lord don't don't do not let man prevail let the nations be judged in your sight put them in fear O lord and you know what there's a lot of that is lacking in the world today why is there such a lack of the fear of god because god has been presented as our great big cuddly teddy bear god amen uh or he's so uh, such a loving god that we we never look at the other side of god's attributes that god is also a god of justice and judgment and a fiery god and a uh, consuming fire but we want to present him as the the big soft gentle nice guy and that's just not what the bible presents him as is a god of wrath and a god of mercy and we have to receive his mercy amen and so he says, put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations, because we see that in the world today. Do we not just switch on your TV, if you like, and you'll see nations are in uh, uh, rebellion against God. This has gone off a bit, don't worry about it, but we're coming to an end, don't worry. Uh, the nations have a lack of the fear of God, and not only nations, but individuals as well. As we saw, it, well, nations are made up of people, aren't they? So it's not just... The nations, in a general sense, you know, we're a good people. Our whole country is a country of good people. We're all going to stand before God. We'll be okay. No, it'll be individuals, one by one, we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. And finally, as he said, uh, just one verse from Psalm 118. Um, Psalm 118, verse 6, if I can quickly find it. said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. What is it? You know, they, they, they may think there's something, but I want you, Lord, to show them that they're simply men at the end of the day, and they have no power where, uh, over you or your plans or your purposes. Amen. So the Lord was fighting the battles for David, was he not? Who's fighting? Who's on the Lord's side? Or whose side was, was David on? The Lord's side. And we have to ask ourselves the same question today. And I wanted to close by telling you, uh, by going to one last verse, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If the Lord was on David's side, and David's on the Lord's side, who is going to be fighting our battles for us? We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you are living in victory? Because your enemies can't do anything. They can't stop the purposes and plans of God for your life. You've got to be one who can say, I'm ready. I've put my trust in Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going. I'm right with God. And I know that if God was to judge the world, I know I'd be standing there completely in the victory in Christ Jesus with his righteousness as my own. Amen. Amen. Jesus came into this world to win that victory for us. Amen.